Good evening, everyone. This is Jim Simons welcoming you to our Musings lecture tonight. Uh, we at Monte Vista Grove in Pasadena have been doing these lectures for eight years now. And it's exciting to me that our speaker tonight, Marilee Robertson, will be the 22nd person to be one of our lecturers. So over the years, what we have taken as our topic is to muse at the juncture of faith and culture in the 21st century. As cultures change, faith needs to respond to those changes. Otherwise, it becomes a backwater. So we're trying to say, how does faith meet the needs of our culture today? Our first six lecturers were Gary Demarus, Jane Vasquez, Dale Bruner, Franklin Wu, Dudley Woodbury, and Joe Kane. And we put into this book, uh, oh, here we go. There's the book, Faith and Culture book, which uh, we still have copies of. And if people want one, they could get one from me. Uh, and then the other speakers that we had, I, I just enjoy reading off their names and remembering them. Paul Pearson, David Tomlinson, Norm Thomas, Nancy Mackey, Joyce DeGraff, Tom Erickson with Kirk Winslow, Ann Tomlinson, Bruce Calkins, Barbara Matthew, Barbara Matthew Dean Thompson, Thompson, Ron White, Ron Jim White, Simons, Simons, Marilyn Manning, and Tom Egeby. So, so here is this a wonderful list of speakers that we had, and, and tonight we are honored to have Marilee Robertson as our speaker. Norm Thomas will introduce our speaker. Gems come in small packages. Some are engagement rings, others are persons. In February last year, a gem joined the Monte Vista Grove community. Small of stature, but with a great heart, Marilee Robertson soon became for me not just a near neighbor at the Grove, but also a treasured friend. Tonight you have a, pres a special treat in store as Marilee shares about her mission service on three continents. She was born in California and grew up as one of six siblings on a ranch in the Simi Valley, north of LA. Her family, however, had bi-national roots and sensibilities. Her father was born in Mexico, where her parents spent the early parts of their married life and raised Marilee's three older siblings. Marilee is a person in mission for life. Tonight she will share about her work in other countries, but she continued that commitment and passion upon her return from Pakistan and Iran. At Woodlands Presbyterian Church, she served as elder for mission and Christian education. She was active in peacemaking at the Presbytery and Synod levels. During several summers, she volunteered with a group called No More Deaths, carrying heavy water bottles and sleeping on the ground as she brought aid to immigrants in distress in the Arizona desert. For the past seven years, She's been visiting refugees seeking asylum who have been detained without trial at the Adelanto Detention Center. She participates now as an active member of Knox Presbyterian Church in that ministry. Last year, the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship awarded Marilee the Barstow Driver Award given annually since 2014 to a person who's get, made, taken significant risks in their retirement for the cause of nonviolent peacemaking. At the award ceremony, activist council member Tamara Rosano said of her, Marilee Robertson has accomplished more in her lifetime than many, if not most of us, will in ours. A tireless advocate for justice and peace still actively volunteering every month. She is the face of God's love to others. It's been my privilege tonight to introduce Marilee Robertson. Hi everyone. I'm calling this talk a Presbyterian adventure. 
because I see my life as an adventure, an adventure in learning, and because in many ways this adventure has been inspired by, guided by, and maybe even provoked by the Presbyterian Church. I will be forever grateful for my small town upbringing and nurturing by our community Methodist Church in what is now the Sumi Valley. Deeply embedded in my memory is sitting by my mother in church and realizing that she was communing with God. And I was hoping that someday God would be as real to me as to my mother. I grew up went to UC Santa Barbara, didn't go to church much, but the hunger was still there. At the end of my junior year, I boarded a Greyhound bus and ventured up to UC Berkeley for summer school. Everything there was outsized. The campus, the peeling bells of the Campanile, the new friends, but the most important thing is that the God I had perceived in black and white terms, I began now to see in technicolor. God, in her grace, broke through the clouds of doubt and became real in Jesus Christ. I knew then that my life was going to be different, though I didn't know how. After graduation, I returned to Berkeley to work on my teaching credential. The church I attended, First Presbyterian, had many mission speakers. I considered the possibility that my calling might be to be a missionary. One of the speakers was Donald Dodd, director of the El Guasio Christian Service Center in Puerto Rico. After the service, I asked him some questions, and he suggested that I participate in an ecumenical summer work camp in Puerto Rico to get some hands-on mission experience, which I did. Our job was to prepare El Guasio for the upcoming summer conferences. A new missionary skill I acquired was how to use a machete to cut down the vegetation which had overgrown El Guasio the past year. On Sundays, a small group of us climbed a steep, slippery mountain to conduct a church service in someone's house. Our very elderly and feisty hostess in this simple house was a member of the Independista Party that wanted complete independence from the United States. So I got a little taste of Puerto Rican politics. On my last night in El Guasio, Anne, the nurse, asked me if I would like to climb up the mountain with her where she was going to deliver a baby. I will never forget the scene a one-room house with no running water, the men standing outside and the women inside telling the mother to push, puha, puha. Anne ordered the men to bring water from the river and the women to boil it, and then she set to work to help the mother. It was a first and difficult birth. Finally, the baby came and Anne handed her to me while she did all the things you do after a birth. I'll never forget the spongy feel of this tiny baby. We staggered down the mountain in time for me to catch the bus with the others to get our plane from San Juan to New York City. Our pastor at First Press Berkeley suggested that I might want to get some practical work experience before attending seminary. So I got a job in a small town in Northern California, where over two years, I taught physics, chemistry, algebra, geometry, business math, home economics, and physical education. I was too young to realize that you really can't do that. So with these experiences behind me, I went to the biblical seminary in New York which is now the New York Theological Seminary, and earned a master's in religious education. All these experiences helped to confirm my call to be a missionary, and I applied to what was then the Board of Foreign Missions and was accepted. 
After orientation, I set off for Pakistan on a freighter, the USS Flying Independence. It was 1957 during the Suez Crisis, and it took us two months to go from New York to Baltimore and Savannah, picking up freight, and around the tip of Africa to Karachi, plenty of time to think about the future. My appointment was to start a science department in a girls' school in Lahore, Pakistan. But first, I want to say something about what was going on in the Islamic world before and during the time I spent in Pakistan and in Iran. It was a time of great change in that nations were emerging from being under the control of colonial powers. In the case of the Indian subcontinent, the British Empire was forced to leave India in 1946. And the Muslim negotiators decided that their large Muslim minority would be a separate Islamic country, Pakistan. It was a steep learning curve as the country was figuring out how to govern itself, not an easy task for a population of very poor people and very wealthy landlords. Not long after I arrived, the country experienced a military coup and General Ayub Khan became president. Two more military coups occurred within the next 11 years. Here are some first impressions. Our ship arrived in the port of Karachi during the last days of Ramazan, the Muslim month of fasting. We were on the upper deck of our freighter while the cargo was being unloaded. I have this vivid memory of red turban stevedores moving among the tractors and howitzers, gifts of the United States to Pakistan. The first mate directing the traffic looked up at us and said, what a cargo, guns and missionaries. Then came the call to prayer. Immediately to a man, the stevedores prostrated themselves for prayers. The random movement of red turbans was suddenly an orderly array of men at prayer. A few days later was Eid al-Fitr, the end of the fast, a happy time of celebration, feasting, and new clothes. Now we were in Lahore. Friends took us to observe Eid prayers in the beautiful Badshahi Mosque. These two images made a lasting impression on me. Laborers at prayer on the deck of a ship and hundreds of worshipers in one of the largest mosques in the world. For me, it was a, you're not in Kansas anymore, moment. After a year of mainly studying Urdu, I was supposedly ready to start teaching at Foreman High School for Girls. With my Urdu instructor, I had read up through page 40 of the physics text which was about 400 pages long. I was understandably nervous. But first, a little about the location of our school. It was situated in the old city of Lahore. Carbon dating indicates that this one square mile of Lahore had its first inhabitants about 2000 BC, contemporaneous with the Indus River Valley civilization. During the Mughal period, which began in the 16th century, the city was fortified with walls and was entered by 13 gates. The British destroyed most of the walls and gates. Some were rebuilt, such as the ones you see here. This is the Delhi Gate, so-called because it faces toward Delhi. Near this gate, there was a thriving clinic run by a Presbyterian doctor, Chris Martin, who was also my neighbor. So whenever I had an ailment, it was handy to go by the Delhi Gate Clinic, then push my bicycle through this gate on to the school, not too far away. I'd like to take you on a bicycle ride to Foreman High School for Girls, starting on Empress Road 
where I lived. Or we could go by Tonga, getting to Circular Road, which goes around the old city. We arrive where the Shah Alami Gate used to be and enter the city. A wide street takes us through a wholesale bazaar. We turn off this street and suddenly are in a labyrinth of narrow passages that lead to people's houses, usually two or three stories high, rising straight up from the alley. We're apt to meet some water buffalo and have to stand aside to let them pass. Soon we come to a place where steep steps approach a large wooden door in the wall. We climb the steps and on entering the door are surprised to see a bright sunlit courtyard full of lively girls. Several small groups are jumping rope. And others are chatting. The courtyard is surrounded by three separate but connected buildings, each with a separate staircase. This is a building we rent. It's refugee property that was formerly a school for Hindu girls and has a small temple in it. By agreement, the Indian and Pakistani governments leave all religious buildings intact. We used to joke about our Christian school for Muslim girls with a Hindu temple in it. Most of our students were Muslims and arrived at our school wearing burqas, which they soon laid aside. The first event of the day was morning prayers up on the balcony, led by one of the staff. The smaller girls were down in the courtyard. We were not allowed to proselytize, but the teachers used psalms and stories from the Bible. We were required to have a special teacher to teach Islamiyat to our Muslim students, and we had a Bible class for our few Christian students. Parents liked our school and didn't object to our Christian activities. The nativity drama was a favorite. It was special to be Mary, who of course is important in the Quran, or to be an angel. Here the kings are awaiting their entrance while little girls peek through the burlap curtains. This picture was taken during an assembly of the whole school. We filled the courtyard. No social distancing here. We had many assemblies, often led by the students. Notice the buttress in the foreground. The ground was fairly unstable in this area, so occasionally we had to prop up a wall with a buttress. We had girl guides and bluebirds. This is our library. I noticed when I visited students' homes that they had very few books. So we made an effort to add books and to let the girls check them out to take home. Foreign school had its beginnings in 1864, when there were no schools for girls in Lahore. Several missionary women began classes in reading and writing and cooking and sewing. So you can see the home economics class spilling out into our courtyard more than a hundred years later. We took students on field trips. Here, the second graders are setting off for the zoo after they had been studying about animals. 
It was a special treat for them to be able to sit on grass, a nice change from hard bricks. And to ride on an elephant. I took my science students to visit the Atomic Energy Center in Lahore, where they could talk to real scientists. Most of our students lived in or near the old city, so we took them out into the country to see some natural beauty. The teachers went on picnics too. My first science room was tiny on the third floor with no running water. The students had to carry water up two flights of stairs. Eventually, I had a larger room and was able to outfit it nicely with sinks and lab tables made by the Christian Boys Technical School in Gujanwala. As I mentioned, I was fearful about teaching physics in Urdu, but my students were patient and helped me when I stumbled. It helped that science is kind of hands-on, so I didn't have to be talking all the time. Equations are the same in Urdu as they are in English, but I did have to learn to read and write in Urdu. Can you read this? It says hydrogen. We had a science fair for parents, that is, mothers. Men entered our school only on rare occasions and for special reasons. Here some magic is going on. And here the girls are showing their mothers the telescopes they had made. Remember Archimedes' principle? The students put on a little drama about how Archimedes demonstrated to the king that his crown was indeed pure gold. Here is Archimedes. She was a good sport to go through this routine about six times that day. When it was time for our 10th grade students to leave for their government exams, we had a special program called Yomi Shama, meaning Day of Light. It was like a graduation ceremony. The 10th grade students passed the light on to the 9th graders. After 11 years at Foreman High School for Girls, I went to teach at the community school in Tehran in 1969. Living in Tehran was a very different experience from living in Pakistan. Tehran was more modern, more sophisticated than Lahore, and at first I was homesick for Pakistan. Our student population was quite international. Though over half our students were Iranian, divided between Muslim and Jewish, most of our Jewish students were Iraqi Jews and had come from being persecuted in Iraq. One of my students jokingly told me that his family slept with their suitcases under their beds. We had a few Jewish students whose families believed that they were in Iran from the time of the exile. The rest of our students were from many countries, mainly from the United States. We had students from the Philippines, Korea, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, the children of the ambassador, India, and the Eastern Bloc. For our American students, it was a wonderfully international experience. An American friend of mine said to me, my son's three best friends are a Jew, a Muslim, and a communist. 
I grew to love Iran, its spectacular mountains, its vast deserts, its beautiful oases, its cultural treasures. Here we have the Medes and the Persians at Persepolis. It's domed mosques and shrines seen all over the country. And of course, my students. At one point, I began to ask myself, how will I know when it's time for me to leave? We were always aware of some unrest in the country, though Shah Reza Pahlavi was very firmly in control. Once, one of our new American teachers, on his first day of class, gave a critique of the U.S. government. Then he gave an assignment. I want each of you to write a critique of your own country's government. Later, an Iranian student came up to him in the hall and quietly said, Mr. Elver, we don't do that here. And many of us had heard stories of people who were considered dissidents. A taxi driver told us of being imprisoned just because of some books found in his house. One of my Persian teachers told about being in a cell where he could not stand up or completely lie down. And we were sure that one of our teachers was a member of Savak, the notorious secret police. Time doesn't permit telling of the increasing unrest, the coming of the Ayatollah to our very own neighborhood to live, the takeover of the U.S. Embassy, and the takeover of our own school campus by the Revolutionary Guard. The meetings and the decisions made about what we should do, some of us decided to stay and the school board rented another site in the north of Tehran where we had a wonderful final year before the government closed all foreign schools. The year I arrived home, 1980, was the year our General Assembly voted to receive the report of a committee which produced this little booklet, Peacemaking the Believer's Calling. Living and working in Pakistan and Iran had raised many questions in my mind about the behavior of my country in relationship to other countries. For example, I had learned that in 1953, our CIA had engineered a coup against a democratically elected government of Iran, having to do with the control of Iran's oil. It was a revelation to me that the church of which I was a member was also raising these questions and that a committee had dedicated five years in study and preparation of this report. I've lifted a few sentences from the report. 20 centuries ago, in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus the Christ. Now there is a special time in history, a season, a kairos, summoning the faith and obedience of God's people. Ominous clouds hang over human history. There are frightening risks in the continuing arms race and looming conflicts over diminishing energy resources as centers of power struggle for control. But we believe that these times so full of peril and tragedy for the human family present a special call for obedience to our God, the Prince of Peace. There were other influences. My sister, Ray's involvement in the struggle to end the nuclear arms race. The Los Angeles Catholic worker community that taught me how to do nonviolent civil disobedience. Witness for Peace got me started on short-term trips to Latin America, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Colombia. On these trips, we heard from many people, religious leaders, union leaders, grassroots organizers, 
and U.S. Embassy personnel. But we spent most of our time with marginalized people, people who had been displaced from their lands, whose communities had endured massacres and other disasters. In El Salvador, I stayed with a family in a community which had been hard hit by an earthquake. In this community, houses had only one or two feet of wall left, above which they had rigged boards and corrugated metal sheets. Here's the family I stayed with, Fernando, his mother, Lucia, and two sons, Leonardo and Marvin. Every morning, Lucia went to the market to sell something she had prepared the night before. This community was part of an organization of earthquake victims working for their rights. It was dangerous work. Every day I went with Fernando to this office. Sometimes we were warned not to leave the building until certain suspicious vehicles had left the area. Later, I was shocked to learn that Tita, one of the organizers, had been disappeared. She was most likely murdered. In 1994, I had the opportunity to spend about eight months in Nicaragua. It was part of our church's reconciliation and mission program, which brought together 10 people from Central American countries and the United States for orientation. Then we scattered to each other's countries. My assignment was to work with the women's organization of the Moravian Church on the Atlantic side of Nicaragua. My home was to be in Puerto Cabezas on the Caribbean coast. This was a very new Nicaraguan experience for me. My previous visit there had been on the Pacific side during the U.S. supported Contra War against the Sandinista government. I was with Spanish speaking, mainly Catholic folks. But in Puerto Cabezas on the Atlantic side, I was mainly with Miskito Protestant Moravian people. This is a typical Moravian church that you see all over the region. It is on stilts because the land is often flooded. Most of the houses were also elevated. My hosts were Consuelo and Carly Webster and their little daughter. They became good friends. The Miskito Indians are one of three indigenous groups on the Atlantic side. The culture is quite male dominant and the women of the Moravian Church had recently formed a women's organization of which they were rightfully proud. My assignment was to work with this organization. Yolanda was one of only three ordained women in the Moravian Church and the only one in the region around Puerto Cabezas. The women had many conferences. Getting to these conferences often involved long, bumpy rides on trucks. This woman managed to pick up a chicken along the way to take home. These meetings were important to the women. Here is Julia, who took a long, rough truck ride with her two little girls, even against her husband's wishes. At one of my first meetings, I asked the group of women what they did in the church. Well, we sweep and dust and wash the linens, we cook, and we teach Sunday school. Then I asked if there were other things they would like to do. One strong woman spoke up and immediately said, I would like to preach. The Moravian churches were scattered up and down the Caribbean coast, along rivers and 
on inland waters, so traveling to them could be a challenge. The Rio Coco was the main thoroughfare along the border between Nicaragua and Honduras. It was well traveled by dugout canoes and served as a very porous border between Nicaragua and Honduras. Outboard motorboats were faster but had disadvantages. On this particular trip, because the river was low, we had to get out and push most of the time. I'll give you an example of travel in other ways. Edrina, mother of eight and wife of a poor subsistence farmer and fisherman, was a natural leader and enthusiast for the Moravian Women's Organization. She invited me to accompany her on a visit to some remote communities up the coast. We met at the port where Adrina made arrangements with a boatman to take us on an overnight sail up the coast. His boat was small and crowded with freight and people. It was a beautiful, if uncomfortable, overnight moonlit trip. We met with several groups of women. Notice that the writing is neither in English nor Spanish, but rather in Miskito, which is the language most Moravians in the North speak. After visiting these churches, we took another overnight trip south in a boat on inland waters to Krukira, Edrina's community. After a good sleep and a delicious lunch of fish caught by Edrina's husband, I found a truck back to Puerto Cabezas. I'll never forget something Edrina said sitting in her house. Somos pobres, pero somos contentos. We're poor, but we're content. Soon after I returned to the United States, I attended the 1995 General Assembly as a mission advisory delegate. It was there that I heard the shocking news of the disappearance and murder of Pastor Manuel Saquic in Guatemala. And now three of his colleagues in the Cachiquel Presbytery were being threatened by a death squad. Julia Ann Moffat, who was PCUSA liaison to churches in Central America and the Caribbean, approached me to ask if I would be willing to go to Guatemala to accompany one of these pastors. And so on September 1st, I left for two months of accompaniment of Pastor Lucio Martinez in Chimaltenango. When I arrived, I found a church and community in deep mourning for Manuel. When he disappeared, members of the presbytery and others had conducted a wide search for him throughout the whole territory. It's a long story, but eventually, eight days after his disappearance, his body was found. It had been buried in a shallow grave near the military base, where it was learned that he had been tortured and murdered. It's a sad thing to note that Guatemala's very brutal military received aid from the United States. Manuel's friends and colleagues were engaged <clears throat> in trying to bring the perpetrators to justice. It needs to be said that people in Guatemala were so traumatized by the military that they didn't always speak up when someone was murdered. The Cachiquel Presbytery took a different stance. They denounced the acts and worked to bring the perpetrators to justice. Church dignitaries, including Marge Carpenter, moderator of our General Assembly then, visited officials in Chimaltenango to persuade them to act. It was a pleasure to live in Lucio's home with his wife and partner, Josefina, and his five daughters and three grandchildren. It was a happy and busy 
household. Their daughters were Esther, a nurse, Hudit, a nursing student, and Sonia and Anna, high school students. An older daughter lived next door with her three children. Josefina, in addition to managing a busy household, was active in the Synod and did pastoral work in a couple of communities. It was my job to go with Lucio wherever he went, whether to the Presbytery office or the Mercado or to meetings in Guatemala City or to communities under his charge. Here is one of those communities celebrating the establishment of a fruit tree nursery. <clears throat> These folks are attending a workshop on human rights. That Lucio and Manuel were teaching people about their rights under the peace accords put their lives in danger. Everywhere we went, there was music. No community was without a marimba. I went with Lucio and others to his field to harvest his corn. I doubt that his job as presbytery executive paid much. I think what I enjoyed most was going with Lucio out to the communities in his charge. This is what he told me about his work. Our way of working is different from other churches. We don't have buildings. This is because we don't have the money to build them. And what money we do have, we buy a little land where the women can raise vegetables and livestock to sell. So I was thinking to myself, oh yes, they have house churches. On this Indigenous Peoples Day, October 12th, I want to say that for me it was a great gift to live among Indigenous people in Nicaragua and in Guatemala. In Nicaragua I saw how foreign logging and mining companies had devastated their forests and polluted their rivers. In Guatemala I saw that their Mayan heritage was very important both to costumbristas, those following the, the Mayan religion, and to Mayan Christians. Once, when walking in Ishiche, an ancient Mayan site near Chimaltenango, Lucio was talking to us about Mayan customs and how important they are to his people. He believes there is a strong connection between animal sacrifice in the Mayan religion and in the Old Testament, and also with the sacrifice of Christ. He says it's intimately connected to justice. Hmm, lots to think about. I'm still processing this after 25 years. Well, this is a part of my adventure. It occurs to me that God loves us too much to leave us alone in our comfort zones. The Apostle Paul wrote to his Corinthian friends, Brothers and sisters, do not be children in your thinking. Rather be infants in evil, but in thinking be adults. God has so much to teach us and shapes us through all kinds of experiences. Thanks be to God. If anybody has any questions. Marilee, let me uh, begin by saying you have taken us on an incredible adventure and to be a part of uh, the founding of the country of Pakistan <laughs> to uh, Iran during the uh, overthrow of the government, to be uh, in all those uh, Central American countries with uh, those wonderful people, the indigenous people, the Mayan Christians. We're just uh, so delighted to have heard your story.
So if people want to ask a question, they can click on the uh, chat and then write the question at the bottom of your pay, uh, screen or raise your hand if you want to give a spoken question. Um, we have several comments in the chat box so far. A lot of congratulations and thanks. Um, uh, Marilee is no ordinary Presbyterian. Marilee, you got some love from uh, Jerry and Colleen and Terry, Janet, and Val. Uh, your SFV friends and Janet Elkins. Uh, Betty Kahana. Um, a lot of people, Marilee. <laughs> a lot of people saying thanks and congratulations. I see a question here from Nancy Mac M Mackey. Besides political revolutions, what determined the timing of your changing assignments? Yeah, I didn't have time to go into that. Uh, I, I went from Pakistan to Iran thinking it would be a short assignment in Iran and I would return to Pakistan. And this is because I, I wanted to have some experience using the new science curricula that I learned about on furloughs. But what happened is while I was in Iran, uh, Pakistan nationalized all foreign schools, or at least all the Christian schools. So our school was nationalized. And although the schools were eventually turned back to the church, ours wasn't because we didn't own our property. And so it was, it was closed forever, at least as wasn't closed, probably the government school is still there. So I hope that, well, of course, I, it, there was a good reason for leaving Iran. Uh, we could no longer be there, work there. So is, does that answer your question, Nancy? Oh, okay, oh my goodness, others, all right. Um, did you ever fear for your life? <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, not, not really. Uh, there, you know, when, when the, um, do you remember when all of those helicopters came to Iran to try to rescue the, the um, uh, hostages? Well, that was sort of a scary time because, you know, we didn't know how Iran was going to react. It was a silly thing to do because if anybody, they were going to try to go through Tehran to where the U.S. Embassy was, and if anybody's tried to drive in Iran on the streets that lead there, they would have had a hard time getting there. So we were glad it wasn't a successful mission because it might have been a bit hard for us. And uh, let's see, are there probably some other times I was a little scared, but not, not much. It was not difficult. And let's see, uh, did you get much opposition from the USA government? Now, I'm not sure what you mean, mean by that, because I don't think they paid much attention to people like me. Um, so, no, I, I didn't have that experience. And how effective was the church in bringing about justice to those who disappeared, uh, disappeared Guatemalans? I don't think those people were ever brought to justice, even though and I'm sorry, I didn't have a picture of the big poster, the picture of the man that we're quite sure, they were quite sure, had been responsible for Manuel's murder. Uh, but I, I don't, as far as I know, he was never brought to justice. But at least consciousness was raised, both in Guatemala and in, uh, in the United States, about what was going on there. And... Uh, yeah, uh, okay. I, I will say this. I think the fact that so many people went to Central America and saw what was going on and came back and spoke in churches and spoke to civic groups, I think that uh, helped change some people's minds. Okay, Betty, Betty, hi. Uh, yes, I speak Farsi. Hali <laughs> Not very well, but I, I spoken well. I didn't teach in Farsi. I taught in Urdu in Pakistan, but I didn't teach um, in Farsi. But I could get along. I could speak to people when I went on trips and went shopping and so on. 
Okay, let's see. Ah, I'm having a hard time. Oh, in Pakistan, did morning hymns ever include other Muslim songs or sayings? You know, I don't think so, Lisa. Uh, our, our, our teachers were all Christians and we, they didn't, we never tried, it would have been foolish to try to convert people. That's not what we were there for. We were there to render a service. But Psalms, I think, are inspiring to everyone. And they would tell stories with a, you know, with a moral uh, teaching. And uh, yeah, so that's the way it was. And we had an Islamiyat teacher. She was one of my good friends, really a wonderful person, who, by the way, was a minority in in Pakistan because she was a member of the group which is in Saudi Arabia, the uh, Wahhabi group. Anyway, okay, uh, where are we? To young ministers, what would you want to say? That's a good question. Go and see for yourselves. You know, instead of going to Europe on a vacation, go to El Salvador or Nicaragua or Colombia. You know, you can go and be an accompanier in Colombia uh, with church folks that are, are in danger there. That's a, that's a really great thing to do. So they're just, I just think that's the most important thing that anybody can do is to go and see for yourself. Okay, uh, Val, okay. These are my buddies, my visitation buddies, Val and others here. Okay, all right. Um, okay, Jerry, well, I've got some fan. I, I recruited fans with my nieces and nephews. Jerry, knowing what you have what you have experienced, would you do anything differently in your adventures? Well, I'm sure I made bad decisions at times. Uh, I'm sure there would be things that I would do differently, but I certainly would not have wanted to go to all of these places that I went to. And again, I'm thankful to the Presbyterian Church because it was through your auspices that I got to do these, go to these places. And where are we? Um, okay, and uh, okay, all right. What has the readjustment to American life been like for you? Well, actually, my first year home was difficult. Um, for one thing, I started teaching American students in American schools, and uh, I found they were kind of different from those students I'd had in. Pakistan and in Iran, especially Pakistani kids, they were just so glad to be in school. It was the big thing for them. And for the most part, that was true uh, in Iran. And uh, so I, I had to adjust to a different kind of student when I came back. And, but anyway, it, it all worked out. I had a lot of people to help me along the way. And what is happening now at Adelanto. Oh my goodness, that's a big one. <laughs> um, there are people on here like Val and others that could tell you more. Uh, we can't go and visit now because of uh, COVID, but we write to people and uh, there's some great people that I know that are making it possible for people who come out of Adelanto to um, to get adjust to you know be live outside of detention. In fact, the church that I go to, Knox, has adopted a woman named Irma that we support, and uh, other groups are are doing that. In Adelanto itself, we hear many stories of people suffering from COVID. Of right now, the big story is about people from C C Cameroon. It is absolutely a death sen sentence to send a person back to Cameroon. Uh, 
it, that situation is so terrible, nobody should ever be deported to Cameroon. And right now there are, I've forgotten how many people who are on the verge of being deported there. So um, it, it's, it's very sad. And, you know, I mean, I could say a lot about the conditions in Adelanto. The medical situation is very bad. And uh, they wait a long time before they ever take somebody to the hospital. And um, so anything we can do to change U.S. policy with regard to immigrants is really important. Okay, let's see, what is happening? Tell us about your visits to, okay. Well, Rachel, I guess I've answered that um, because I don't visit now, I can't. Lawyers sometimes can visit, but not always. Um, but I, I hear a lot about it and I hear, I just have to tell you this, it's so inspiring. There's a church in San Bernardino, which has just converted a lot of its space to house, I believe it's four, no, five people who've just gotten out of Adelanto. And, um, you know, they, they clean it up, they get furniture, they get people to do all kinds of things for the people who come out. Let's see. Oh, okay, Cameroon. You know, you should Google it because it's kind of a long story, but I've been hearing this from people I visited in Adelanto for, for years. Uh, the people that are in control of everything in Cameroon now are the French speaking folks. And they treat the English speaking folks very badly. Uh, people I visited said things like, well, I don't, I'm not in touch with my family because they're all hiding in the bush somewhere and they move from place to place. Uh, my brother's house was burned down. My uncle was murdered in front of his family, things like that. Just, it's really terrible, the things that are going on. And uh, I've read some things on Presbyterian news, uh, things about Cameroon, but if you Google it, uh, you, you can find out a lot of things that are going on there. Did I cover everything? So are there any uh, spoken questions? Um, I don't see anyone with their hand up. You just I will check. Again. Okay. Can I say one more thing? Of course. Okay. I want to thank my nephew, Charlie. Show yourself. Uh, because he's helped me so much with all of this, uh, with the, you know, doing PowerPoint and everything. So even though we had some problems, I, I think it would have been very boring just to hear me talk without the pictures. <laughs> Well, Marilee, I'll speak for uh, everybody who is tuned in. You are an inspiring person, and you renew, uh, you renew my confidence, my faith in the Presbyterian Church, which, as you said, sponsored uh, all these projects that you were in, and you're doing the kind of thing that, uh, that, we, we, that need, to be do it would need to be done, and uh, Jesus called us to care for the least of these. Those are the people that you have been caring for. You're, you're a model for all of us, and we deeply appreciate what you've said. Thank you so much from the bottom of all of our hearts. So, we will, yes, the people are <laughs> giving applause. Uh, that was wonderful. So, we do have. Uh, Musings set for next February. It'll be February 22nd. Gary Sattler, who is a relatively new resident here at Monte Vista Grove, as is Merrily. And uh, Gary's ministry, he's an ordained minister, but his uh, ministry has been as a therapist. And I just love the title that he gave me today for his talk A Christian Life. 
colon, my wanderings through faith, culture, and psychology. So uh, let's tune in next February 22nd, and we'll wander with Gary through faith, culture, and psychology. Again, thank you, Marilee, so much for a, a absolutely wonderful talk tonight and for those great pictures.